Hello and welcome to a presentation on biological and radiological agents. As part of the program on occupational health and safety education on emerging technologies, Mid-Atlantic Partnership, or Pocket Map for short. I'm Dan Barnett from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I'm Amir Sapkarat from University of Maryland School of Public Health. As we present the concepts today, we'd like to begin with some general overview principles regarding risk and how it's defined. Risk is defined as the product of the likelihood of an event and the consequence of it. If we want to unpack that further, the likelihood is the product of the threat attached to the event times the vulnerability to it. So when we think about threat and vulnerability, respectively, we're thinking about, for example, with intentional events, a terrorist attack, for example, the intent of the perpetrator and the capabilities of that person or group. And for vulnerability, we're referring to the weaknesses of the target of the attack and the susceptibilities of that target. Lastly, in terms of a definitional background on this slide, I want to highlight briefly about the definition of consequence. So going back to the initial part of our presentation on this slide of risk equaling the likelihood times the consequence, the consequence here is defined as the harm, usually measured in illnesses, deaths, and economic impact. Let's now discuss risk perception, because risk perception and our understanding of risk in this context of biological and radiological threats are inextricably linked. So when we're talking about risk perception, there are several factors that come into play. And for lack of better terminology, let's call them factor one and factor two. Factor one are those things that actually tend to drive down the risk perception. And factor two are those items that tend to magnify how we perceive risk. So things such as, is the risk controllable? You know, how dreadful the risk is? Is the risk equally distributed? And how catastrophic that risk is? And also in the context of how the risk poses threat to future generation. And most importantly, are we able to reduce the risk, right? And how is the risk moving forward? Is it increasing or decreasing? And whether or not the risk is voluntary or involuntary. So if you think about something that we are in control of, think about driving versus riding an airplane. Well, overall, our risk of dying is much higher when you are driving versus when you are riding on the plane. But we tend to have this perception that, you know, riding on the airplane poses a much higher risk of death, right? Because when you're talking about airplane, there's someone else behind the cockpit that is flying the plane and you have absolutely no idea whether the pilot is drunk or whether they're falling asleep or whatever. But when you are driving on the beltway, at least you are behind the wheels. And then if there's something that changes, you have access to the brake that you can apply. So in other words, you have a control over the situation. Whereas when you are riding in the plane, you have absolutely no control, whatever happens, right? So that makes you believe that the risk of dying while you're flying is much higher. So building and extending upon the concepts of risk perception, there is a very useful schematic that was developed by Paul Slovich, a researcher in the 1980s, where he described what are called axes of risk perception. And to clarify, the two axes are whether the outcomes or even knowledge about something are well known or not, and whether high or low dread is attached to the respective threats. Anything that appears in the upper right quadrant of this diagram at the top right of your screen would constitute something that would be considered to be a high risk perception threat based on Paul Slovich's depicted axes of risk perception. Importantly, you'll notice that a number of items in the upper right quadrant of this diagram relate to radiation. So that's germane to our presentation today because when we talk about radiological threats, we cannot decouple it from the high risk perception attached to radiological threats. 
And it's critical to mention here that this is how Slovic constructed his perception of the risk. But if we were to do this, this may vary from one person to another person. So for example, for me personally, I would rank alcohol consumption, you know, like it's ranked lowest, much higher because, you know, consuming alcohol obviously has a lot of consequences, including, you know, a risk of getting into car accident if you're driving and also, you know, long term risk of developing, let's say, cancer of the head and neck region. So for that reason, I would tend to rank it higher. Same way, if you're looking at nuclear war on the right hand side, it's ranked fairly low in that third quadrant. But, you know, and it says there's something that's known about nuclear war. I would argue that we have no knowledge about nuclear war because there has not been one yet. And hopefully we will never have. So the point that I'm trying to make here is, you know, this is in a way somewhat subjective. And if you were to ask 10 person to do this same thing, then they may have completely different picture. You know, like overall, they will have some agreement, but there's going to be some disagreement in this regard. And the other critical thing to think about this is this assessment is based on our knowledge at that given time. So this article was published in 1987. So a lot of things had changed since then, including the invent of the Internet. Right. So, you know, how we perceive this risk is very much dependent on that. So if we were to rank it now, obviously, it will be a little different. And if someone else comes and does the same ranking in 2050, it's going to be very different because our knowledge, remember, is constantly evolving. And that's a really important point. So part of understanding risk perception is monitoring how our collective understanding of risks change over time and how that risk may vary among individuals. So that's an extremely important aspect to interpretation of this diagram. Let's transition to a discussion of biological agents. And we're going to use the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC's categorization of biological agents from what's referred to as a bioterrorism context based on the highest levels of concern in terms of mortality and societal disruption, which constitute category A, which we'll talk about on this slide, to then lower but still important gradations of categories by the CDC's rubric for biological agents. So here we're talking on this slide about category A biological agents, which CDC deems high priority. And just to summarize briefly some key elements that constitute category A, as depicted here. These include organisms that pose a risk to national security, that can be easily disseminated or transmitted person to person, can cause high mortality, and importantly, have a potential for major public health impact. The category A bioterrorism agents or biological agents are listed here on this slide. And this is currently, as of the time of this presentation, the full list of category A agents. They include anthrax, botulism, plague, smallpox, tularemia, and hemorrhagic fever viruses, including Ebola and other types of hemorrhagic fever viruses. Now, it's important to note that a number of these agents can occur naturally. There are natural cases of plague. There are naturally occurring cases of Ebola, as we actually have seen, for example, in 2014 and subsequently. But from a standpoint of biosecurity, this is how CDC describes the highest priority agents as category A. So let's progress to category B biological agents and CDC deems these agents as the second highest priority category tier. These constitute organisms that are moderately easy to disseminate, cause moderate morbidity and low mortality. So the key sort of word here to remember in attachment to category B is the word moderate. And so examples, this is not an exhaustive list of category B biological agents, but these can include ricin toxin, staphylococcal enterotoxin B, something called glanders, melioidosis, and water threats, including cholera and others. So that list here is a partial list of what CDC considers its second tier category of concern for biological agents or category B. 
Let's now transition to category C, biological agents per the CDC designation. And CDC deems these the third highest priority. And a way to conceptualize category C agents in the CDC rubric is that these are emerging pathogens that could be engineered for mass dissemination in the future. And hantaviruses are an example. There were cases of hantaviruses several decades ago at the time of this recording in the southwestern United States. That was not an intentional event, but in theory, a hantavirus could be engineered for an intentional attack. Tick-borne encephalitis viruses and tick-borne hemorrhagic fever viruses. So this set of categories constitute how CDC frames biological threats. So let's talk briefly about novel biological agents. And one of the double-edged swords, if you will, of bioengineering is that with the capacity to genetically re-engineer various agents, it's possible that those who would want to exact harm on people could re-engineer any of the agents that we listed in the previous few slides to have new clinical or other presentations that we haven't seen before. Additionally, agents that no longer naturally exist, like smallpox, which was eradicated several decades ago, could theoretically be created de novo. And in fact, researchers in Canada recently showed that this was possible by creating horsepox virus from the genetic code alone. So we really have to be vigilant on bioengineering, which has made enormous beneficial impact on society, but on the flip side, could be used to exact harm in the wrong hands and in the wrong contexts. Now let's transition to some key principles that underlie biological agents. And we'll focus for these next few slides, illustrating these key principles on the category A agents. So the way that these next few slides appear is you'll see a definition at the top of a slide with a diagrammatic representation of it. And then at the bottom is a comparison of that particular aspect, in this case, incubation period, among the various category A biological agents that we had alluded to earlier. So let's begin with incubation period. Incubation period is essentially the time from exposure to the onset of symptoms. And very importantly, um, the incubation period can vary dramatically among category A biological agents. And those variations can depend on the particular agent, the dose, the underlying health status of the individual who is infected by it. But as you can see along the bottom of this slide, the range of incubation periods can be as short as several hours in the case of botulism to up to 21 days, for example, in the case of tularemia or hemorrhagic fever viruses. So we really need to understand that incubation period because that allows public health and safety authorities to monitor and anticipate how an event might play out from a biological standpoint. The other thing that you also want to think about in the context of this incubation period from when someone is exposed to when they start showing symptoms is whether or not they can transmit that particular diseases to other uninfected individuals, right? So if you think about, for example, coronavirus right now, somebody could be asymptomatic. I mean, in other words, they're not yet showing symptoms, but still be able to transmit that to other individuals. And there are other cases, such as if you look at Ebola, for example, the infected person cannot transmit Ebola virus to another person until they start showing symptoms. So it has an implication in terms of if you think about, you know, how do we go about contact tracing and so forth? Because if someone is transmitting the virus and they are not showing symptoms, that particular person may be thinking they're perfectly fine and going around and doing whatever they do, all right? And infecting other people and absolutely having no idea at all. This is a simple concept, but it has a tremendous implication in terms of public health prevention. That's exactly right. And as you'll see in the upcoming slides that we present, these all have implications for public health management when we talk about characteristics of category A biological agents.
transitioning to this slide, initial diagnosis is another key concept that is relevant. So when we think about initial diagnosis, we have to consider how it's generally made by the clinical presentation of symptoms. As an illustration, in the anthrax attacks following the September 11, 2001 terrorism attacks in the United States, the initial recognition of the index case of inhalational anthrax was made by an alert clinician in Florida who found some unusual presentation on chest x-ray that can be associated with inhalational anthrax. So one of the key points is while we have superb technology at our disposal these days for recognition and monitoring of the emergence of these kinds of events, it's critical to keep in mind that ultimately it's the alert clinician who is on the front lines of initial diagnosis. Once a diagnosis is made, however, it's important to confirm it, and that can entail laboratory tests and should entail laboratory tests, and some of these can take days or weeks to complete. Lastly, as depicted here, rapid diagnostic clinical tests, at least at the time of this recording, are not currently available for most bioweapons agents. So we really do need to be vigilant about presentations of these kinds of clinical circumstances. One thing to keep in mind that's a particular challenge in recognition of Category A agents is that all of the Category A agents have a what's called a prodromal or early presentation that looks a lot like the flu. So their unique characteristics don't emerge until after that early prodromal phase. So it's important to maintain a heightened level of vigilance Obviously, in medicine, there's an old expression that common things are common, but if we don't think out of the box in terms of other possible causes of a clinical presentation, then it's possible that we may miss or be delayed in recognizing a biological event.